we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 26 of Urgency of Change. This week's episode is an interview by Eric Robson. Next week is a conversation with Alan Norday entitled, Is There a Permanent Ego? This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please see our official advert-free YouTube channel for hundreds of video and audio recordings of full talks and selected extracts. We are a non-profit charity and rely on your support to continue to preserve and make Krishnamurti's work available. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Eric Robson is a broadcaster, author and documentary filmmaker based in the UK, where he also farms. For 25 years he chaired Gardner's Question Time. This 1984 conversation with Krishnamurti was part of a television series he hosted called Revelations. Questions Robson asked Krishnamurti include Did you ever believe, as the people who were sponsoring you believed, that you were some sort of messiah? Can you explain why you are so positively against organised religion? Is your system rooted in any religion? How do you strip away conditioning? Is there only one truth or are there many truths? When you approach the pathless land of truth, do you have to do anything with that truth? Is it possible for everyone to achieve truth? You have said that the world can only change through personal transformation, and yet the world is sliding to the edge of a black abyss. Won't personal transformation simply come too late? Hello. In the next two weekends, thousands of people will arrive at a country house in Hampshire. Their pilgrimage is to see and hear a man who, for many of them, is a spiritual figurehead in the same league as Buddha, Muhammad, and Jesus Christ. Now, these are comparisons which J. Krishnamurti, now 89 years of age, would be the first to shrug aside. He was born in India to parents who were neither particularly influential nor wealthy. There was, however, something special about him right from the start. At the age of 14, he was discovered by Annie Besant and C.W. Ledbetter of the Theosophical Society, a group of radical thinkers who believed there was a common strand of truth to all the world's great religions. They believed the young Krishnamurti was the new messiah and groomed him to become the world's spiritual leader. At the age of 27, while in California, Krishnamurti had a revelation which changed his life. It happened while he was watching a man mending a road. He wrote, that man was myself. The pickaxe he held was myself. I was in everything, or rather everything was in me, inanimate and animate. Later that day, Krishnamurti felt the presence of the Lord Buddha. He went on, I have seen the light. I have touched compassion, which heals all sorrow and suffering. It's not for myself, but for the world. Not long after this, Krishnamurti rejected his title of world spiritual leader and disbanded the organization that had grown up around him. Everyone, he said, and still says, must find his or her own way to the truth. And nevertheless, although he rejects organized religion and titles such as leader or teacher, he has a huge following. Schools which bear his name have been set up in various parts of the world, which along with many other subjects study his thinking and writings. We went to one of these schools, Brockwood Park in Hampshire, to talk to Krishnamurti himself. Throughout your life you've been regarded as, as someone special, but what was it like at the age of 14 
to be suddenly plucked from obscurity? I'm afraid I don't remember, actually. <coughs> but I was rather shy. I avoided all this. I didn't like all the personal worship and kind of looked up as a great man and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as I grew up, I avoided crowds. When I was asked to speak in a public meeting, I was so shy, I tried to speak behind a curtain. <laughs> And they didn't work out, so I came out of, from behind the curtain and talked. I, probably I've read a rather lonely life. Not lonely in the sense apart, but keeping away from all the noise and all the fuss and all the absurdities. Did you ever believe, as the people who, who were sponsoring you believed, that you were some sort of messiah? Uh, you know that word messiah is really Jewish word, comes from, you know, that. I never bother about it, really. <laughs> Sounds rather funny, but it really, act seriously, I never bother about it who I was, what I was, it was not very important. And I really mean it. And I was given great many properties all over the world, castle in Holland with 5,000 acres. I returned all of that because I didn't believe, I don't believe still organized religious structure, hierarchical uh, attitude towards life. But before you renounced the position that your sponsors were trying to put you in, in California you had what uh, I suppose I would describe as a revelation. What was revealed to you? I, 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 I've read the story of when you, uh, you yes. saw a roadman. Yeah. Yes. You, you felt that you were part of him, part of the, the yes. hammer he had yes. in his hand. Yes. But you see, the difficulty is to go into it very seriously. I don't know how to put it clearly to you. You know, there's a great tradition among the religious, serious religious people, perhaps not so much in the West, that you must go through various forms of self-purification. Not by starving, fasting and all that, torturing the body, but a sense of inward cleansing, as it were, if you can so put it. A purification of a brain that is not self-centered, that's not concerned with personal progress, personal achievement, and all that business. I think it was, and it is still is, a part of deep religious feeling that not the abandonment of the world, but share very little of it, as much, as little as you can, because you have to live in this ugly world, not the beautiful nature, but what man has made of it. I think that's what happened, to put it very, very simply. That was what you realized when you Yes. On those yes. incidents when you, yes. you saw the road mender and when you yes. stood under the pepper tree yes. and experienced, I think you described it as, as a supreme happiness. Yes, more than happiness. Happiness is really a, by, a side issue. 
but much more a sense of wholeness. You've already mentioned your rejection of organised religion, but can you explain to us why you are so positively against How those can things? you organise a human being according to a pattern? Where there is a religious pattern, faith, belief, dogma, rituals, how can you shape man who is extraordinarily alive and f to a particular mold, like the communists are trying to do, the totalitarians are trying to force man to a certain way of thinking, which is so contrary to freedom. Freedom, I mean, man has always sought throughout history to be free. That was one of his urgent, constant demand. Not only from poverty, environmental ugliness and so on, but to be free from the sorrow, pain and anxiety and so on, those things. And how can any structured uh, religious attitude give him freedom? So if you've rejected religion and you've rejected faith, what's your alternative? It's rather complex. To put it simply, Human beings have been always self-centered, always selfish, to put it very brutally, simply. And <coughs> various religions have tried to um, help him not, not to be so self-centered. And Identify yourself with something greater. But the greater is still part of selfishness. And so I think one should really begin with self knowledge. The ancient Hindus, long before the Greeks, have said, Know thyself first. Because if you don't understand yourself, basic, fundamentally, whatever you do will still be the activity of illusions. So, know thyself. Not according to some philosopher or some psychologist, but know yourself in your relationship with the world. Not only the external world of nature, I'm saying this, not the ancient, not only your relationship with nature, but also your intimate relationship with, with whom you live. Relationship is like a mirror in which you, you see yourself directly as you are. No pretensions. Watch your reactions. Understand your reactions and go beyond them. And it's much more complex human structure, human brain, human behavior, and so on. So begin with yourself. Is your system rooted in any religion? Is your method Ah, a method and a system is again a pattern. You don't have a method, you don't have ah, a system. That, of course not. Because, after all, that's what human beings have sought and lived with patterns. Obedience to the pattern, obedience to a certain ideal. All that has led to such enormous conflict. Look what is happening now. The ideals of the communists 
and the ideals of the democratic world, they're in conflict. So really one has to ask much more, a serious question, what place has ideals in life at all? They may have no place at all. What is important is to begin with what is actual. We are having a conversation now, a dialogue, in which both of us are sharing. We talk freely, I hope, uh, inquire, investigate. Therefore, there is no system in that. Both of us are seriously concerned about it, something, and we begin to have a dialogue about it. Why human beings throughout the world live in conflict? Why should we have a system about that? And whether we can be, live without conflict? Because conflict is destroying the world, not only in personal relationship, but with, with nature, with other human beings. So, is it possible to live without conflict? Is it possible to live a life of great, if I can use that word which has been so spoiled, love? and be free of suffering. And this is, we should have a system of inquiry into that. But it, in inquiry, we discover great many things. If we are both attentive, watchful, and we discover the most fantastic and real thing. And, and the perception of that brings us together. There is no you and me, the perception. I know you've written that before you can be sure of anything, you have to strip away the conditioning. But how exactly do you do that? I mean, you're presumably conditioned as a Hindu. No. You've stripped that away? Oh, long. As a, when I, it meant nothing really to me, whether to be a Hindu or a Muslim, or a, you know, Christian. I mean, I, these are all human brains have been programmed, like computers. Well, I'll come back to my system and method now, then. Yes. How do you strip away the conditioning? That's the whole point. Is there a difference between you and your conditioning? You understand my question? It's very deeply ingrained. No, just look at it. You say, how can I strip away, put away my conditioning? That means there is a you and the conditioning. Which means there is a division. Right? Or the you is also conditioned. I don't know if you follow it. Yes, I do. Therefore, the problem is not you and the conditioning, there is only conditioning. But we have grown to the, in the habit of me and the condition. I must do something about it, as though I was different from it. So when there is that division, there is conflict. That conflict is a totally false, because I and the it are the same. Right? The observer is the observed. Are we together in this? So, if that is a fact, which is, which it is, then watch it without any movement of thought. 
I don't. This yeah. becomes a little more complex. I say, for example, human beings are frightened of fear. Right? Fear of death, fear of living, fear of tomorrow, hmm? fear of. They have, from most primitive, most ancient man to present time, man has fear. Fear of tomorrow, insecurity, all the rest of it. And he has always tried to overcome it, suppress it, run away from it. But the I is fear, right? So can, can one watch this fact? Can, is there an observation of this fact without division? I don't. The eye is, if you want to go into it much more deeply, the eye, the self who is the watcher, is the past. Past memories, past incidents, past recognitions, and so on. And then that past, which is the eye, looks upon the present as though it was something separate from itself. And then there's conflict in that. But the I is that. Is there only one truth? Or are there many truths? There's only one truth. There's not Muslim truth and Christian truth or Hindu or Buddhist. There's only truth. Would you agree or see that truth has no power? It's not Christian path, Hindu path, or communist path. So it's a pathless land. If truth was fixed, then there's a path to it. But it's a living thing. You can't say, follow It's a living thing. And each one interprets it as is in his own according to his own conditioning. They generally agreed truth is universal. Any, any obviously thinking man does. But I've been brought up, suppose one has been brought up as a Christian, you translate that truth according to your what you have been programmed to. See, the question really is whether one can be free of this conditioning totally and have a brain, have a mind that's completely free from all program. Then there's a different state altogether. I follow you up to there, but doesn't that lead us to a paradox? That the people who listen to you, who come to this school, who listen to you in India or California, do they not regard you as a signpost in no, a pathless no. land? I've always said there is no authority, including myself. I'm not your leader, guru, and all that nonsense. I really mean it. For me, that's an abomination. To me, that's the original sin. <laughs> if I can so put it. Each man must be a light to himself, right? Because uh, uh, freedom is necessary. Freedom from one's conditioning. Freedom from all the travail of that is part of our consciousness. But really, how can someone who speaks as powerfully as you do, who thinks as clearly as you do, not be regarded as a leader by lesser men? So at every talk, at every discussion, I say this. Don't do it. Be careful. Don't. You follow? It's so silly. Because you're destroying yourself. You're following. I mean, what Kay is talking about may be utterly false. 
have begin with scepticism, don't accept anything, including what I'm saying. You are, work it out, let's discuss it, let's go into it together. So that there is no you as the leader and I the follower. We are together in this beastly business of living. <laughs> Can I ask you what happens? When you approach the pathless land of truth, when you step over its boundaries and you find yourself there, do you have to do anything with that truth, or does it just do it for you? Do you remember, I invented a story long ago of two men walking in the street. And they've been friends for a long time. And one day as they're walking along the road, path, and along the street, one of them picks up something, looks at it, and his whole face is absolutely changed, radiant. And the other says, what the, what the dickens has happened to you? He said, I picked up something which is part truth, which is most marvelous. And the other fellow says, let's go and organize it. Is it possible for, for everyone to achieve this truth? Obviously, if they apply their mind, their heart to this. You said that you believe that the world can only change through this personal transformation. And yet the world is sliding, it seems, to the edge of the black abyss. Won't the, the personal transformation simply come too late? If you change radically in that sense, you're going to affect the world. It may be very little, but you're going to affect. Like a bad case, like Hitler, it's a bad case. He was insane and all the rest of it. He affected the whole world. He's in all the rest of it. So I think if a few of us radically changed, there will be a tremendous effect, naturally. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us.